phenomenal woman sitting right here, Amelia Morton Robinson. Amelia Morton Robinson to the tenth power, ten times the woman. Amelia Morton Robinson, Selma, Alabama movement. Amelia Morton Robinson, the woman that was the inspiration of the man sitting beside her, Mr. Lafayette, better known as Dr. Lafayette. And these people changed a nation. Tell you where a strength came from, that mother. Because as a little girl, 10, 11 years old, she saw her mother stand up in a courtroom and point her finger at a judge who disrespected her and told that judge, thou shalt not disrespect me and I'll have your job. Yes, yes, yes. Campaign against that judge and got him defeated in the next election. Wow. They walked on the bus one day. She was with her mommy. And the bus driver wanted them to step up on the front door of the bus, pay their fare, get off the bus, go back to the back of the bus and get in the back of the bus and sit down. Mama said, no, 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 and took the money that she should have paid if she had written and threw it at the bus driver's face and walked off the bus. They walked off. <laughs> That's where this woman got her courage from. Her father, and you know how us fathers can be. You know, we can be weak in some fashion. And we can be not really tuned in to what we're supposed to be doing in some fashion. But her father, back in the early 1900s, built a 11 room house for her family. Mm. He had a wood yard as a private businessman. So she saw in men power and strength. She didn't have to worry about the outside world. Following her sister. When she got to college at Georgia State, <laughs> she only was able to stay there for about a year because her sister came home. She was a very smart child. And she told her mama, I don't want a million to come back to Georgia State. Mama said, why? And she said, she's ruining my reputation. Because so she had a mind of her own to do things her own That's way. right. Mm. She said, I don't care. So she left and came to Tuskegee, Alabama. Now, she had met George Washington Carver over in Georgia before. Because she and a little girl saw George Washington Carver talking. And if those of you who know history know that his voice was very clear and very loud. And they thought that was fun. And they were cracking up in the hallway and got busted by a teacher. Mm -hmm. Now, when she got to Central State, she met George Washington Carver again. This time, doing things her way now, always independent, always determined. She's walking through the, she's working in the cafeteria. She's walking through the cafeteria with her tray the way they told her to hold it. What they didn't tell her, though, not to overload it. So then when she got to George Washington Carver's table and the lady who was sitting next to her, she dumped her <coughs> tray over in the lady's lap. And George Washington Carver told her, Honey, don't put all of your eggs in one bag. <laughs> and that was the old folk way of telling you, you know, you got to watch what you do and do it right. Then she met her husband, Dynamite Man. Reminded her of her father, but the husband wouldn't pay no attention to her. The sister brought the husband over to her to introduce her to her, and that was supposed to have been a hookup, you know how we do. And he came over and he said, how do you do, ma'am? Good. He went on back over to his table to his girlfriend. <laughs> now what she said? I don't care. Because she wasn't interested in running behind no boys, no ma'am. She had a horse named Buckman. And she was riding on horse in the community when she went home. And she was taking her daddy car keys and driving his car off into the ditch and stuff. She didn't care nothing about those little things that little girls were doing at that time. Mm. Now, she got out of school, though, and she went to teach over in Georgia. That didn't last long either, because they had a teacher's meeting. And the principal messed around and made the mistake of asking if any of the teachers had anything to say <laughs> on their chair. She raised her hand. She said, I don't like it because you won't listen to me when I'm trying to tell you what is best for me.
my children. That was on Friday. And on Monday, she was looking for a job because she got fired. You know what she said? I don't care. So she went to another teacher's job. And when she got out there, that didn't last long because God stepped in. God stepped in with an offer from the United States Department of Agriculture. Offered her a job. She took it. And they planted her in the seat of racism down in Dallas County, Alabama. Uh, South. So she went right on down there. And her job was to teach poor country people how to cook, how to sew, how to keep house, and how to read. You know what she taught people? How to cook, how to sew, how to keep house, how to read, how to register. That's how right, to that's right. How to buy land, <laughs> and all of those other yes. shit And that made the white folks in Dallas County very mad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they told her and Mr. Boynton later on, stop that mess, you're upsetting our way of life. Mm -hmm. You know what she said, see? I don't even I have care. to tell you. Mm, I don't care. I don't care. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and at one point, they worried Mr. Boynton, they got married. Because she must have put some kind of whammy on him at uh, <laughs> <laughs> And when he thought he was walking off, she must have put something on him because he came back really hustling to try to get into her life. And she let him in. She cared about that. And then she let him in, they got married. That the white races in Dallas County started to work on it. And at one point, uh, she told her husband, Mr. Boynton, I think we'll just, why don't we go to Philadelphia? You know what Mr. Boynton told her? No man will ever run me from my own house. Yeah, no, that's right. Mm. And you know when he told her that, that was so profoundly planted in her mind, that when he died a short time later, she stayed right there in that hellhole and kept right on the fight. Mm -hmm. Now, she's a grown woman now. She had a husband for a minute. Now he's gone. Now, what are we going to do with Selma, Dr. King? You'll hear this better from Dr. Lafayette. Dr. King sent a couple of teams down at Selma. It was moving around the country to try to find out where they could make a movement. And, uh, both teams went back and told Dr. King, there's no sense in going to sell. The white folks are too mean, and the black folks are too scared. Now, there's some little feisty fellow who was up in Fisk University, who sits over there by Mrs. Boynton. He wants to be somebody, see? He wants to flex his muscles. He's in Fisk University, he's going straight ahead. But he decided to ask <coughs> Dr. King, please send me to He gave himself. And you know what he credits as the inspiration that made him stay in that hellhole? This woman here and a woman by the name of Marie Foster. He said that the strength and the love that and determination that he saw in those two women motivated him to stay. Mm. Now he'll tell you some reasons why he shouldn't stay because he got beat down in the street and almost killed one night too. Mm. But the most important thing about it, he may tell you, he may not tell you, one night she was going to the hospital to take care of her husband every night. And Dr. Uh, Lafayette told her, let me go up there and stay with Mr. Boynton. And you go home and get some rest. And I'm surprised to say that she accepted because she's so proud and so determined. But this man sitting here told me about a spiritual transformation that happened to him in that hospital that came from Mr. Boynton into him. And no beatings himself could run him up out of there mm. until they developed a way to get some justice. Now, is that Mr. Boynton dead now? People liked him pretty good. <coughs> hey, let's have a memorial for Mr. Boynton. And they went to the uh, pastor. Henderson, I believe it was, and asked him if they could have a uh, memorial in the church. The deacons, the black deacons said, no, you ain't neither. You're not coming up in here. You know those folks didn't like that man. And we, we ain't going to do nothing to 
made me man it up. Mm -hmm. And that pastor stood like a natural born man. And that pastor said, if we can't have it in the church, we'll have it on the street in front of the church. Mm -hmm. Shame the deacon so much, they finally let it happen. Now, that was a mistake on somebody's part, and I think it was Sheriff Jim Clark. Sheriff Jim Clark, if you Google him, if you read his story, was one of the meanest racists that ever existed on the earth. And the reason I know that is because a news reporter contacted him a few uh, weeks before he died and asked him if he had it to do all over again when he do the same thing. He said, yeah. Sheriff Jim Clark said he would do the very same thing. Oh, again. my yes. God. Mm. Mean man. Yeah. Mm. Mean man. But I'll tell you what he did. He made a mistake. He arrested this woman one day. Mm -hmm. You know what she said? She said, I didn't know whether to go with him or take my left hand and fuck him. <laughs> she was the people in that community was fed up. Told her, go ahead to jail with me, Mrs. Robinson. I mean, she was Mrs. Boynton then. We'll be down there with you. Now, you know she didn't believe that. Those people were scared of Jim Clark and everything else that was me walking around there and mm. stuff. He took her to jail and locked her up, and blessed be, and about a couple of hours, here come a whole slew of people under arrest to go see about her. Mm. And I want her to tell you about that moment in jail, mm. and I want her to tell you about the promise that we told you we was going to be. These 67 people did. They were standing in the courtroom <coughs> or standing beside the courtroom where they were trying to get into the county courthouse to register. Some of them had been there seven o'clock in the morning. And many of them were there tired worn out, but they wanted to register and vote because they had never, and when I said to them, a voteless people is a hopeless people. You like the ants on the ground. You like anything. I don't care what person, a person of color would say that was true. So they would be put in jail or they would have their jobs taken away from them. And I went to the courthouse, having been a registered voter ever since I was 21. And that's what you had to be when you were of my age. <coughs> and uh, when they got together, and they decided that they would be a registered voter in the I was in the courtroom. When I came out of the courtroom, and they were, 67 of them were standing. And what I said to them, they were going for lunch. I passed by the courthouse. And I was in the street walking. And Jim Clark said, get in that line with the other neighbors. I said, I'm going to my office. I said, get in that line. And he definitely ran me from where I'm sitting here to the base of that wall. Caught me held me by my neck and said, didn't I tell you to get in this line? And I didn't know what to do. <clears throat> I didn't know whether I should hit him in his head <laughs> or whether I should just go limp. <coughs> and just about that time, I was parallel to those who were standing up. And they said, go to jail, Ms. Boynton, go on to jail. We'll be there with you. <laughs> and 
tell us what's right from wrong. Mm -hmm. And just like you tell a child, don't you do that. That mind is in that child and it knows right from wrong. And I thought the other day, <coughs> when I heard that uh, I would be among young people, and I thought how when a baby is born, you take these young ones, just look at them. They have lovely toes on them. But when they get to be 10 or 12 years of age, you can't put on those diapers like you put on them when your mom was talking to you. You needed more clothes. You needed bigger clothes. You need something that will cause you to, it's supposed to, uh, to clad you. I don't know what you do. Some of you, I don't know what you do. No. But I heard a young man say, when I see a woman trying to coerce me, and she has a stress on me until it makes me mad, and I just turn her off. I don't want to have anything to do with her because she is trying to induce me. And a lot of black people are just the whites, the blacks, the browns, all of them are trying their best to induce. And I pray to God that the star will come down to your knees. <laughs> <laughs> and I would, I'd like to speak about drugs. I had a young man who told me that he did not want to hear anything about drugs. And he worked. He said that, well, I go to the crack house. You might know what it is, but I don't. I go to the crack house when I get my check. And I these to my friends, and I give them whatever, whatever I want for the check. And it, they have a high, and I don't know what a high is, but they have a high for 15 or 20 minutes, and then they come back right on down to earth. And when they don't have money, they go back and their friends give them money to do that. And when you look at yourself, what will you do when that high comes down? Look on the ground and you see the ground. Look up and you will find that you have an imagination to do whatever you want to do. Because it means that at least between 18 years of age and until you get to 65, you are building. And I don't know whether any of you have walked the birds or not. The birds go in and out, building their houses for the young ones. And that's what you want to do. That's what you should do. And I say to each and every one of you, take God with you. Because when you go to Him, ask Him to please guide you, please lead you. Remember, He is the greatest who will ever be. And He will give you what you need. So look in the glass and look at yourself and realize you have from 18 years or more to work, to be independent. What are you going to do when you're independent? You are going to work so when time comes, 
for you to be able to sit down and talk with anybody else, or you may be able to listen to what others say. Then I'll tell you what my mother said, because people told me that you are not from us. They don't know that God didn't make a one person or two. He made one first. That was Adam. Then he gave Adam a mate. And he expects the two to work together. And they named him. And my mother used to say that Lift up your heads, ye descendants of Ham. You are brothers of God, and you are kings of man. For God in his own time, sooner than late, will raise you again to your former estate. Remember, God made one man. And all men shall tell who I am that I am, and the world will rejoice with the children of heaven. Let us look at Dr. King. He and all of the people who believe in him, and that's where you start to rise. Then you are brothers to men. For God in his own time, sooner than later, will raise us again, and it's going to be left to you children to be raised again to your former estate. Remember, we have President Obama follow him. And all men shall bow to I am that I am, and the world will rejoice of the children of Ham. Take your place in your life by which God has given you. You will be the American, not black, not white, but you will be the American human beings that God has made to lift you up. And we used to have a stone. Lift him up, lift him up. Though he speaks through eternity, if you be lifted up above the earth, all men shall bow unto you. Oh my God! All the young people in this room, I want you to Google the name Jimmy Lee Jackson. Jimmy Lee Jackson was there on civil rights demonstration in Marion, Alabama. And his mother and one of his relatives got into a debate with the state troopers. The state troopers went into the restaurant where they were, and Trooper James Fowler pulled his pistol, shot Jiminy Jackson twice in the stomach, and killed him. That was a highlight of that march. He shouldn't have done that. Because these people in Selma was fed up too. And they decided one man wanted to take his body down and put it on Governor George Wallace's step. But you know how we are, we wouldn't do that. So they decided, no, let's don't do that. Let's walk all the way from Selma to Montgomery to tell Governor George Wallace that we are sitting with the story. They tried, tried, did what, then they tried and did what. A state trooper walked up to her and told her to run. Let me see how smart you guys are. Did she run? No. No. Ooh, no, man, let's get some smart <laughs> She didn't go no place. She said, run for what? He said, I said, run. And she said, for what? He cracked her across her back with a long nightstick. And she looked at him as if he was good to eat or something. And then he cracked her down across the fine uh, bone, though, the hand mm. knocked her unconscious. Mm. And another state trooper stood over her and pumped tear gas. And that day, they had these old tear gas canisters. And 
do tear gas. And she credits a plastic cap that a woman had given her just before the march that she put on her head. Mm. And it fell down over her face and deterred some of that gas from mm. her sister. But she carries today, as you hear her talk, an injured throat. Mm. And she carries, as she stated, as a badge of honor to stand mm. as a natural born woman. Mm. And so now, that was several movements. The expert over there would take you a little bit further. Let me tell you why she's so serious about God. Mm. She left Selma and went a couple places and came to Tuskegee, married another man. They went to Savannah. They got on a boat to go from Savannah to one of the islands. When they got on a small boat to go across, a large boat came down the command, taking a big wave and flipped their boat open, open, okay? Now, she couldn't swim. Her friend couldn't swim. Her husband could not swim. The captain of the ship could swim, and the other person in the boat apparently couldn't swim, because everybody in that boat drowned, except, including her husband, except her and one other woman. And, this other woman yelled to her, Amelia, you can't let me drown. Now I'm sure Amelia said, I can't swim either. How am I going to help? But somehow, God stepped in. Mm. Her God and our God mm. Mm. stepped in. And she was able to grab this lady's coat when she went down the second, went down twice and came up. Mm. She grabbed that red coat and held on to that red coat until some young uh, Pleasure Riders was coming down through the canal on a boat, saw all the debris and all the rumbling in the water, came there, pulled them out, took her and her friend to the hospital, and when her friend lasted for two days and died, and you, you can see that you're closer. Oh, okay. 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 Okay, her friend. Uh, didn't make it, but you can see now that she's alive and well. Mm. As Chief Frazier was saying, I uh, decided to take Selma when Selma had uh, an X through it on the map, hmm. on the wall. And it's all uh, the account uh, in my, my book that's available over there for autographs. And the reason I decided uh, was because I was curious that they said that uh, the reason that was given for these two different independent teams, and the teams we were talking about were SNCC folk. These were students who had been beaten, arrested, they were on a freedom ride, sit in, and all that kind of thing. So they were not neophytes. They had gone through many battles, and, and they had stripes, okay? Not on their chest, but on their backs, to show what they'd gone through. They came back independently with the same conclusion. Nothing could be done in Selma. Bob Moses had been already assigned to Mississippi. Charles Sherrod had been assigned to Southwest Georgia. But not Selma. So we're not doing Selma. And the question was, I asked, why? He said, well, the white folks are too mean, and the black folks are too scared. So I said, uh, my goodness. Uh, you had Montgomery, Alabama, that's in Alabama. You had the Birmingham group, that was in Alabama. Why is it this little tiny place in Selma is so uh, peculiar and different? So they asked me, uh, you want to go take a look at it and see what you think? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> you want to be an assistant director of uh, uh, with Bob Moses and you could be assistant
assistant director, uh, if you want to uh, go with Charles uh, Sherrod in Southwest Georgia, I said, if I wanted to be an assistant director, I'd go get married. <laughs> take a look at it? I said, uh, no. I'll take it. Take a look at it. I'll take it. And I didn't go running to South Alabama to look at it. What I did was decided that since they didn't expect anything, <laughs> I had nothing to lose. <laughs> so I took my time. The first thing I did was started research. And that's the thing I want to emphasize, the research. Okay? The first thing I researched was the library where I could do the research. What was I looking for? Well, the first thing I was looking for was how could we find out why the white folks in Dallas County were so mean? Yes. That was important. Yes. Because then I remember I was on the Freedom Rise, and uh, what happened was after we got beaten up in Montgomery, on the Freedom Rides, I was on that Freedom Ride and on that yes. bus platform, mm -hmm. and um, John Lewis got hit on the head, and Jim's word got beaten to the middle rings. I was there with William Barbie. They had a steel pipe that they put down his ear. Mm -hmm. and I was there. I saw all that. Mm -hmm. They tried to kick me in a certain place on my body, and I went down to protect myself and end up with the Brogan shoe. Okay, kicking me in the chest. Mm. So I went through the Freedom Rides with uh, three broken ribs. Because mm. mm. you can't do surgery on ribs that are cracked. Mm. So I just went ahead and uh, did that. And I remember when we took off with the federal troops on the bus and helicopters and state troopers every day headed to Jackson, Mississippi. They bypass Selma. It's on Highway 80. When you go from Montgomery to Jackson, Mississippi, it goes straight through Selma. You know what? Even the army, even the <laughs> army would not go through Selma. Mm. They send a decoy bus and they bypass Selma. You know why? They said there were 2,000 people waiting at the bus station at Selma. For the freedom rides. They said, if you thought you got a whipping in Montgomery and in Birmingham, wait till you get to sell. Mm. And that's how I remember. So, even the federal government and the army mm. bypassed some. So I did some serious research. And what I found out uh, is the place I could do the research was in uh, Tuskegee, Alabama. Because that library was the only one I could find where they had a publication of the White Citizens Council, monthly publication. That was a library I could go to. Okay? So I went there. And we started doing all kind of research and everything. And finding out about Selma and Dallas County. And I discovered that the original capital of Alabama was not in Montgomery. Guess where it was? In Dallas County? Yeah. And uh, it was a place called the Hop. That's why y'all never heard of it, because it just went and dried up. <laughs> <laughs> they moved it to Tuscaloosa for one year, but they went to Montgomery because it was a flood up there, and they thought they put it on high ground. I'm talking about serious research. There were white folks in Dallas County who were angrier with other white folk in Alabama than they were black folks. You know that? Those people had an attitude towards other white folk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. You think there's a coincidence that more white folks got killed around the Selma movement than black folks? <laughs> Lee Jackson, he attracted a lot of white folks who came down there and they killed them. Ms. Lausso, 
Jonathan Daniels, Rebel Reed, these ministers now, they killed him. All right? And you know why? Because they had a belief that black folks was too, were too scared to try to do something for themselves. And the only reason why they would do something because white folks would come there and, 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 and persuade them and encourage them. So they could kill the white folk. They already got the black folks dead. <laughs> mm. Okay? Last point, and then we open up the question and answer. Uh, well, I got to make this point because uh, Chief Frazier was talking about how they had that long baton. You know, they used to ride on the back of horses and then beat folks as they run by. Mm -hmm. They didn't buy those uh, 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 night sticks from no uh, the, the, uh, factory or the supply house for law enforcement materials. There's a place where you can order, you know, stuff for police and state police and all that kind of stuff. Those night sticks were made at the uh, Selma Table Company. You remember Selma Table Company? They were table legs. Yes, that's why they were so long. Every white male, 21 years old, could go and, and get him with one of those nightsticks. And everyone who was 21 years old automatically was a part of Jim Clark's posse. All they needed was a badge, but they had their gun and their horse. And they went down and got their nightstick. Okay? Yeah. That's what we're talking about. All right? So, my point is, there was that cohesiveness among all of them. Now, the other point I want to make is that they bombed Martin Luther King's house in Montgomery. They bombed Abernathy's church. They bombed uh, folks' homes. And they bombed in, in Birmingham. Yeah, they bombed so many places in Birmingham, there's a place called Dynamite Hill, <laughs> where Negroes' homes were bombed. I said Negroes because that's what it was written in those days. All right? Yeah, bombed. They bombed the hotel. They bombed the church with the girls in there. Guess what? No bombs in South. Mm -hmm. Historians uh, forgot that part. Okay, I observe all things. All right? And the reason why they didn't bomb any churches in Selma, and they didn't bomb anybody's house, <coughs> is because the, the, the licensing council used to have their monthly meetings in the boardroom of the downtown bank. So all those churches and all those folks' homes had mortgages on them. You think they're going to bomb the place in that <laughs> Huh? No. <laughs> no, you don't see no folks running around with no white sheets on and no stuff like that and sell them too much. They had a few of them, but hey, the, the white citizen council controlled that place. That was economics. If they show up at the mass meeting, they wouldn't jump on you. They would fire your mother-in-law. Yeah. And tell your mother-in-law, uh, you need to go take care of your son because he needs more counsel and advice so you don't need to come back to work. Mm. You mess around and get your mother-in-law fired. <laughs> Guess what you're going to have to do? you got to leave town. <laughs> And that's why people were afraid. They were not so much afraid for themselves, they were afraid for their entire family. Mm. Okay? These were sophisticated mm. white citizens' council. Mm. I studied it. That's why I know. And so my point is, there was a peculiarity with Selma. Now, when I went to Selma, finally, to do boots on the ground, I met Mrs. Boynton, and she was standing tall and regal, with that perpetual smile on her face, okay, just as confident. 
She said that uh, you can have your office right here in my office. She was with me all the way. Mm. She had no fear. You've never seen courage mm. like the woman you see right here. Yeah. Yeah. Mentality. There are there are different mentalities, but just like just like there's different ways to teach people how to read it. There's different ways to communicate people. It's different. It's different ways to communicate people and their different mentalities. So I so I do see hope. I see hope, and that's all coming together and understanding each other and learning to respect 